Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our church this morning on Sunday the 6th of March, and welcome if you're joining us on our live stream. This is the first Sunday in Lent, and as such, our cross has made a reappearance, and today some symbols have been added of our story that we will read today from John's Gospel. There is a white sheet and um, a bottle of perfumed oil, and you'll find out where that ties in as we go through this service. The choir will lead us into worship by the introit, and after that we have a responsive call to worship uh, up on the screen. We can have the responses up on the screen. There's a few verses just from Psalm 130. And um, so many of the Psalms were written in difficult and desperate situations. There's many enemies besieging either David or others who wrote these Psalms. And for us, often they're kind of alien and strange. But if we imagine the plight of the Ukrainians today and especially Ukrainian Christians, some of them will be gathering even today in the underground to worship God together, and we are here in freedom, and yet we can pray this with them and for them. So I will say the sentence, the first two sentences, and then the ones in italics, if you can respond. Um, so that's the third and the fourth sentence, and the last two. I wait for the Lord with longing. I put my hope in his word. My soul waits for the Lord more eagerly than watchmen for the morning. Like those who watch for the morning, let Israel look for the Lord. For in the Lord is love unfailing, and great is his power to deliver. We're going to now sing together another psalm, hymn 69, just as a father shows his love.
Father, you give us your love each day. We praise you for the signs of your love and care for this world and for us. On this spring morning, we thank you for signs of new life all around us, for longer days and sunshine, for lambs in the field, for spring flowers. You are the life bringer, renewer of all things. Lord, would you know that despite the light and the beauty around us, we might be in a darker place, even today. We might feel unable to join in with rejoicing, but conscious of our own frailty or of those we love and care for. We might feel our senses dull with grief, unable to enjoy the colors around us. And even if nothing is wrong with us personally, we only have to read or watch the news to be troubled by the darkness and terror that is in this world. We feel helpless and angry as we see the devastation inflicted on Ukraine and its people. We are here today to lament to you and complain. We are here because we need to see you move to tears and angry at the suffering and death. We are here today to hear your voice speak life into all the suffering and death. Jesus, you are the resurrection and the life. Assure us of your love and your care for us and for this world. Take away what hinders us this morning from hearing your voice. Help, and help us to listen to your words of life, to know and be transformed by its truth. All these things we pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. For thine is the king from evil is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to sing another hymn, I Want Jesus to Walk With Me, 539. I think the choir have sung it before, or maybe we've sung it before. No, all new? Okay, right. Well, you love me for giving you new hymns, so just do your best or listen to the first one and then join in with the second. I want Jesus to walk with me, 539. will now come to read for, uh, for us from John's Gospel, chapter 11, 1 to 44.
He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you are going back. Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to waken him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go, that we may die with him. Jesus comforts the sisters of Lazarus. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? 
Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Blessing to these readings from the Holy Word and to his name be the praise and the glory. going to sing a hymn, Hear Me, Dear Lord, in this my time of sorrow. You may not know the words, but the tune is quite familiar. 729. story told through the eyes of Martha that I wrote some time ago. So this is from her perspective. I will tell you what happened to my brother Lazarus. 
It is a long time ago now, nearly 30 years, but I go over this in my head often. In fact, John let me read his gospel account a few days ago, and it has brought it all back to me again. I didn't see it so clearly at the time, but what Jesus did for my brother, well, it really sealed his own death sentence. The authorities in Jerusalem had already tried to kill him, and now they were ready to pounce. They were getting nervous because Jesus had such a big following, and people were starting to believe that he was, in fact, the Messiah. He was going to be the one who would get rid of the Romans for us. Well, the priests in Jerusalem, they were concerned with their own position. They had to keep the Romans happy and us under control in order to stay in power. Jesus knew this, of course, the big political picture, the danger he was in. But he still came to us, to Bethany, even though we are so close to Jerusalem. He laid down his life to give us new life. At the time, of course, I didn't care much for the politics of it all, or even if Jesus was putting his own life at risk. I thought he loved us, and I couldn't understand why he hadn't come straight away to save Jesus or even just heal him remotely, as he had done with others. Jesus was our guest often. We were so close to him. My sister Mary and I, my brother Lazarus, we all loved it when he stayed with us. We would eat together and talk and just enjoy his presence. And he seemed to love it too, being with us. He was our teacher but also our friend. Really, he was as close to me as my brother. So when Lazarus took ill, seriously ill, we immediately sent for Jesus. He would have wanted to know. He would have come, surely, straight away. We believed he could heal him as he'd had healed others. We knew we were quite far away, a couple of days traveling, but... There were stories of people being healed even from a distance. So surely he could have done something to save our dear brother. But no, nothing happened. And Lazarus went downhill rapidly. Mary and I we were besides ourselves with worry. We look after him. He must live. I could see that Lazarus' life was slipping away and I felt so helpless and hopeless. Why was Jesus not with us? I thought he loved us. It's ironic, really. Lazarus' Lazarus's name comes from Eleazar. That means God helps. Well, no help from God for our Lazarus. And then he slipped away. Our little brother, our beloved Lazarus, he breathed his last and he was dead. And Mary and I, we just went round in a daze. Things take over, people take over. The burial was arranged as is our custom within a day. We dressed his body in a white burial sheet and we tied his hands and feet together with strips round his ankles and wrists. We laid his body in the tomb and rolled the stone over the entrance of the cave. And we had mourners to wail with us and sit with us. And then Mary and I, we sat Shiva. We stayed at home and sat on the floor while our acquaintances came to pay their respects. Loads of people came. They all loved Lazarus. But I just felt numb inside. I was in a state of shock. I couldn't quite comprehend what had happened. I'd been so sure Jesus would have come. He would have saved Lazarus. I did not care. I nearly felt I'd lost two brothers. Lazarus. But also Jesus. 
Where was he? Then finally on day four, news came that Jesus was on his way. It was like I awoke from a sleep. It was too late now, but I just had to go and see him. I couldn't wait any longer. I'm not one for sitting around anyway. I was upset and angry and disappointed and yet still relieved that he did come. Somewhere there was still this strange sense of hope in me, refusing to die. I just had to go and see him. And so I rushed out. I couldn't see clearly as the tears were welling up again and I nearly tripped a few times. I met him just outside the village. Finally, Jesus. I was so full of muddled thoughts, I didn't know what would come out of my mouth. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. That sounded like an accusation. It seemed to hurt him. I added, even now I know that God will grant you whatever you ask of him. Why did I say that? Surely it's too late now. Lazarus has been buried four days. His spirit would have departed from his body on the third day, as we are taught. Jesus spoke to me. Your brother will rise again. Yes, sure, we all will. On the last day, when the messianic age arrives, the righteous will arise to enjoy the world to come. When the Messiah comes, he brings resurrection. That is what we believe, at least most of us. God has power to give us new life. But the resurrection on the last day, well, that's no good to us now, is it? I wanted my brother now in this life. He was too young. Where was Jesus when I needed him? Then Jesus says something startling. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever has faith in me shall live even though he dies. And no one who lives and has faith in me shall ever die. It sounds like a riddle. And yet suddenly I know it's true. Somehow knowing Jesus and him being here with me is life. Life amidst death and doubt. Life and hope amidst confusion and grief. He asks me, do you believe this? I know he's really asking me, do you trust me? And then I surprise myself. My doubts suddenly melt away. I know and I believe. Here is the Messiah. He brings the resurrection life. I do, Lord, and I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God who was to come into this world. I don't know at that point what is going to happen, but I know it will be all right. The Master is here. There is life for us somehow. Well, something did happen. Jesus raised Lazarus back to life. I know it's incredible. I, I couldn't comprehend it then, and I still can't, but he was there, our brother, alive. We had seen what Jesus could do, who he truly was. We saw him in all his glorious power and love. He brought us life. And now, has our life got any easier? Well, we did have our brother back, so that was fantastic. But our journey with Jesus wasn't quite plain sailing after that. News of Lazarus's raising spread like wildfire. Jesus had really signed his own death warrant by giving us life. The authorities in Jerusalem soon issued a warrant, a death warrant, for Jesus' arrest. 
Actually, the chief priests came after Lazarus too. They wanted to kill him. He was a living proof of Jesus' power, and they felt their own power slipping away. Lazarus had to go into hiding. And I am sure you've heard what happened after all this. They did get our Jesus. They crucified him. But they could not keep the resurrection and the life in the grave. God raised Jesus up as Jesus had raised Lazarus. And I know now that nothing in life or death can separate me from him ever again. I don't have long to live. I'm in my 60s now. Things have not been easy. Everything is in turmoil and the Romans have destroyed Jerusalem. But I know my Redeemer lives. And I know that one day he will raise me back to life, eternal, to enjoy the shalom of the age to come with my brother and sister and all God's children. This is my hope. He is my hope, my life. Death has lost its sting. Well, that was Martha's story. There are many times when we find ourselves waiting for a response from God, where nothing happens, where we mourn over what could have been the case, if only. Jesus' waiting in this story seems incomprehensible to us. God's timing can be puzzling and frustrating. And we start to question his love for us and his power. Even today, when we watch the destruction of Ukraine and the mindlessness of this war unfolding, we ask, where is God? Why does he not stop this? And of course, there are so many wars and conflicts going on all over the world. We need to ask this question and lament and at the same time hold on to hope and faith that the Master is here, is there in the midst of all of it. And he will come to bring life. He is the resurrection and the life. Amen.
Sarah's coffee drop-in will be on uh, on Friday from 10 to 12 when you're very warmly invited to come along if you're free for uh, coffee or tea in a scone between 10 and 12 um, just down here in the hall and um, bring a friend or just turn up by yourself and enjoy the chat and the fellowship. Our um, reading group through John's Gospel continues on Wednesday evenings by Zoom. The other thing which I meant to share with you, and uh, I'll include it in an email at some point this week, but uh, Freeland Church have organized an evening with John Archer, who's a comedy illusionist. I think he was on Britain's Got Talent or something like that a few years ago as well, and there has been an evening before, I think about four years ago, which uh, was a, a great success. He's uh, apparently very funny and obviously also does some tricks and it's uh, being held at the Old Drum Furley, um, Old Course Drum Furley Golf Club on Saturday the 26th of March and it, uh, the cost is £25 for a ticket which includes a hot buffet and obviously a whole evening of entertainment. So there are a few of these flyers on the table as you leave the church uh, and I'll try to also remember to send a link out um, with the information uh, or and posted on our Facebook page but that's recommended um, the other thing I want to say and I have included in today's email as well uh, but just to, to encourage you if you're able to give online to the DEC disaster emergency committee appeal for Ukraine that would be uh, the best way to be able to contribute and help towards uh, the relief efforts for Ukraine. This includes a whole range of you know, very well-known and trusted charities such as Christian Aid, Tear Fund, the Red Cross and so on. And that way they can buy what they need, where they need it and uh, yeah, just give the most effective support and supplies. Um, if you have money with you and you want to give in cash, we have two... Um, this opportunity as you leave the church to give that way and then our treasurer will make sure that gets to the right place. We'll also do that next Sunday, so we'll keep the monies over until next week. Um, our prayers will um, focus on the situation in Ukraine and a colleague pointed us to the fact that there's a, um, a short song in our hymn book, Kyrie Eleison, which is a, a a response used in many churches, which means Lord of Mercy, it's Greek, Kyrie Eleison. Um, and this actual tune that is in our hymn book is a, a Ukrainian um, traditional chant. So the choir have learnt it, and we're going to use it as a response during our prayer. The choir will sing it, but if you think you've picked it up, it will be in our prayer four times. So feel free to, to join in at those moments. Um, I will say, in your mercy, hear our prayers, and then uh, the, the chant is Kyrie Eleison three times. Okay, let us pray. Lord Jesus, you wept over Jerusalem. You wept as you knew it was heading for destruction. Lord, we weep over the destruction of Ukrainian cities and towns as we speak. We pray for the people of Ukraine defending themselves, many trapped and many fleeing their country. Strengthen them and protect them. In your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord Jesus, you told us to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. And so we also pray for the people of Russia who are being lied to by Putin and the regime around him. We pray for the veil to be lifted from people's eyes and to see what is actually happening and being done in their name. 
We pray for those who have protested and are protesting against this totalitarian regime and are risking arrest or even their lives in some cases. And we pray for the young soldiers being sent to war based on lies and are frightened. We pray that this pointless, ruinous war is stopped and that Putin does not get his way. In your mercy, hear our prayers. <laughs> for the international community surrounding Ukraine, for the countries nearest who are receiving hundreds of thousands of refugees, Poland, Hungary, Moldova, Romania and Slovakia. May aid agencies be able to get and do what they need to bring supplies and offer housing and support. We give thanks for the resolve that there has been in Europe and Britain and beyond to back Ukraine and resist Putin that we pray for wisdom for world leaders to know what more they can do. We pray most of all for an end to this war and for justice and liberty for the Ukrainian people. Give peace in our time, O oh Lord. In your mercy, hear our prayers. <laughs> disappointments, for our own conflicts and divisions, for our own struggles and losses. We pray to you also, Lord. Even if some of these have perhaps been dwarfed by what we see on our TV screens, they can be all-consuming in our own lives. We pray for peace, for healing, for comfort, and just to have you by our side. You, the resurrection and the life, bring new hope and life today. In your mercy, hear our prayers. <laughs> Let us stand to sing our final hymn, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing.
Jesus says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you all forevermore.